to see your faces. Yeah, if you're in, you can just show your video for now. Yeah, hi to all of you. And uh, very quickly, I'm going to share screen after this and then uh, we straight into our session. But let me just pray for all of us, uh, even as we prepare our hearts uh, and come before the Lord. Just come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Yeah. Father God, I just thank you. Thank you for giving us your spirit to empower us, to feel us and control us and direct us and be with us. Thank you for giving to us your word. As we open your words to 2 Timothy, Lord, we thank you for the precious word there. And Lord, even though this is a background and overview session, I want to pray that Lord, your word will also still come intimate, as practical, as helpful for each and every one of us tonight. That Lord, we will leave this place uh, greatly knowing that, Lord, uh, uh, we have touched base with you. Thank you, God, as we also prepare ourselves for the church coming series in the next two months, uh, in August and in September, as we talk about this book. Lord, we want to pray that uh, you will open our eyes and enlighten us to your word. And uh, most importantly, you would uh, change our hearts as we allow your word to take control, as we allow your word to take charge of our lives. So tonight, Lord, I commit to you myself, commit to you the workings of these uh, uh, teams and uh, the computer and the Wi-Fi, and especially all my brothers and sisters who take up their precious time to learn tonight. Lord, we ask that uh, you will feel the rooms that we are from, the place that we are meeting at right now, and uh, this uh, hour and a half uh, with your goodness and with your strength. This we all ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. So, yeah, this is how you okay. <laughs> all right. Let me just uh, go into my share screen mode so that I can share with you uh, what we have over here. Uh, Did I get it wrong? I think I'm not sharing the right thing, right? Sorry. Ah, there you go. Okay. Oh no. Okay. I think you got it right now, right? All right. Okay. So we are at Second Timothy, and uh, I hope you are able to download the slide deck uh, PDF that I've just sent out just before this class session. Yeah. Uh, the PDF. Uh, let me just warn you. It will take quite some time for you to download because uh, it's quite a big file. Okay. So be patient. Uh, if you have not yet downloaded it, uh, it'll take you quite some time to download. All right. So tonight we are going to talk about uh, Second Timothy. Um, let me just share with you now as an introduction. Um, Paul. As he writes Second Timothy, and as the book of Second Timothy starts, uh, Paul was now in a second imprisonment, and the prognosis for the release from this second imprisonment was really bleak, as far as he knows. Second Timothy was written five years after First Timothy, and was written about yeah, one yeah, yeah, year yeah, yeah. after, yeah, wait, after wait, the wait, book I mean. of Titus. And uh, if you compare 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, you'll realize that they were written for different purpose. Remember last year, actually about this time in July, 
we also had a similar uh, Zoom session to talk about First Timothy when we were preparing for First Timothy. And about one year after right now, we are doing Second Timothy. If you remember, uh, First Timothy talks about church organization because Timothy was just entrusted to run the church in Ephesus. First Timothy also talked about leadership roles and selection. Timothy was told uh, who to select as elders and deacons. First Timothy also talked about false teachings and combating against false teachings. So remember, those were the focus of First Timothy. If I can add, uh, First Timothy also talked about perhaps uh, young Timothy, a new leader who needs a lot of encouragement, and Paul was giving that to him. Now, five years later, 2 Timothy was written with vastly a different uh, purpose altogether. As I mentioned in my first statement here, Paul uh, knows that his death is impending. So he knows that this probably may be his last, uh, last letter to Timothy. So he was writing to Timothy to share with Timothy firstly about his own personal struggles. Okay? His struggles in prison, his struggles, how he faced many people deserting him at this point of time. And at the same time, he was also sharing with Timothy uh, Timothy's state of mind. What Timothy needs to have the state of mind he needs to have as he prepared to lose his mentor, as he prepared to run the church right now as the leader on his own without his mentor, Paul. So you can see that 2 Timothy is very much different from 1 Timothy. While 1 Timothy was trying to encourage the reader, 2 Timothy was trying to tell the reader of the urgency that he need to hand the baton right now to him and for him to take on the, the new mantle as the leader. Second Timothy was also probably the last preserved episode that Paul ever written. Uh, I added the word in brackets here, preserve, because this is what has been preserved down to us. Okay. Uh, Paul could have written other letters after 1st, 2nd Timothy, but none of those were preserved for us. Right? So we do not have any of them right now. So as far as it's not the last letter in the New Testament, no, but it was the last letter written by Paul. In this letter, Paul talks about the impending death. The death is near. In this letter, he talks about his last will and his last testament, as he knew that he is he has to do so. In this letter, Paul know that he has to do something. He has to hand over. He has to hand over uh, the leadership uh, of this church uh, to his protege, uh, one of whom will be Timothy. In this letter, he is going to give his final charge to Timothy. Timothy, this is my last word to you. And remember in those days, the written letter will take some time, weeks, if not months, for it to reach its destination. So he knows that he needs to pen his final charge carefully in written form. And then the fourth thing we can say about this letter is this. First, second, Timothy and Titus are commonly called the pastoral letters or epistles. And that uh, in that they are addressed to individuals or on pastoral matters. Now, I have already covered a lot more on uh, what it means for it to be a pastoral letter, so I won't cover too much. All that I want to tell you is that it is addressed to individuals. They are personal letters and they are also letters to talk about how to be pastoring over uh, their flocks. What do I mean by pastoring over their flocks? I'll give you two examples here in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, for example, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, it says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, 
and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. This is a pastoral instruction. It's an instruction to another leader to know how to pastor his sheep. And so this is uh, what we call, why we call this a pastoral letter. Uh, this not only just found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. In verse 14, Paul continued to give this kind of pastoral instruction. He says, keep reminding God's people of these things. This is very pastoral already, right? Uh, taking the people as your sheep. Okay. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruin those who uh, listen. And so these are just two examples I want to give to you that uh, these are pastoral instructions found in 2 Timothy. But above all, I want to tell you this letter is a very, very personal letter. In fact, 2 Timothy is more personal than 1 Timothy. And I will have to say this, 2 Timothy would be one of the most personal letters that Paul has written. Probably the second most personal letters. The most personal letter that Paul have written would be the letter of Philemon. Okay? Because in the letter of Philemon, uh, it's written to Philemon to talk on a very personal matter. It's just the letter is solely about personal matters. Okay? So, but in 2 Timothy, I would say that it's probably the second most personal letter written by Paul. Uh, we can see that, for example, by the second person uh, that has been used. The you that is mentioned 27 times. The your that is mentioned 12 times. Uh, if I were to use the NIV, uh, I, I used it for counting. So you can see that it is a very direct letter from one person to a second person. Secondly, it is also a personal letter because the book tells us that it's written only to one person chiefly to Timothy. Verse 2 says that it is written and addressed to Timothy. Thirdly, it's a personal letter because it's a very affectionate letter. Paul did not hold back his feeling for Timothy. He called him my dear son. Okay? He expressed that he missed Timothy and he wanted Timothy to visit him. He also expressed, especially in the beginning, in verse 3 to 5 of chapter 1, his personal memories of how he knew Timothy even uh, uh, before this letter was written. Okay? He says this, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. This is very personal. And then I recalling you, recalling your tears, probably referring to Timothy's tears when Timothy parted ways with Paul the very last time. And Paul says, I long to see you. So you can see here, he expressed the personal desire and affection Timothy has for him and he has for Timothy. And then Paul go on to say, so that I may be filled with joy and I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Wow. A very personal introduction indeed. Not only just that, but this letter follow up with many personal instructions. I, I, the whole, whole letter is full of personal instructions. So I, I put out from verse 7 onwards, full of personal instructions. In fact, not just only personal instructions, okay, but even personal errands that Paul was instructing Timothy to do. It's almost like a wife huh? sending a WhatsApp to the husband. Honey, before you come home tonight, can you swing by the supermarket and get me a tray of eggs, okay, a carton of milk, okay, and uh, whatever she wants him to get. You know? Personal errands. So here, Paul was telling Timothy, Timothy, I miss you. I know that my time is coming to an end. So, 
if you want to come, you must come and see me. Okay? Do your best to come and see me quickly. Chapter 4, verse 9 says. And as you do so, here are a few errands I want you to do. Number one, bring along John Mark because he is fruitful for the ministry. Bring him along. Bring John Mark along. Number two, you have, I want you to pass by Troas. And when they pass by Troas, pick up the cloak that I left behind, pick up my scrolls and pick up the parchments that I have left behind there. Probably he wants to do some reading in his prison. And then finally he says in verse 21 of chapter 4, Come, come before winter. Probably he need the cloak for winter. I did tell Timothy, you know, you need to come before winter so that I can, I can use the cloak. This is therefore a different situation from what Paul was experiencing in his first imprisonment in the end of Acts, Acts chapter 28, where he was under house arrest, where he was staying in the house, where he has food that was prepared for him, where he could be visited by friends. Now, in 2 Timothy, most likely he was in the dungeon. Most likely he was not treated as well as before. Finally, as a way of introduction, my fifth point to you will be this. There seems to be a certain continuation from 1 Timothy to 2 Timothy. Now, it is not like Paul deliberately was uh, continuing uh, what uh, First Timothy was uh, written, but it seems like the theme of First Timothy was continued on into Second Timothy. If I can just remind you here, in First Timothy chapter six verse twelve, Paul told Timothy, "Fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you were made." Uh, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight, the good fight. Interestingly, perhaps Paul wasn't meant to, do, wasn't meant to purposely uh, continue that idea of fighting the good fight. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, when he referred to himself, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So the fight that he told Timothy to fight, a good one in 1 Timothy, Paul himself says here, I have, I have fought the good fight. So of course we know as we continue on in this introduction right now, I'll tell you the authorship. Okay, we will be Paul, the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. He is the author. Of course, scholars today continue to debate about the authorship, just like they debated about many authorships of many other books in the Bible. So today, if you read some commentaries, some of them may tell you that, hey, uh, it may not be Paul who wrote this book. Okay, uh, somebody else wrote uh, using his name. Now, we are not interested to go into those uh, arguments and debate, but because uh, when we talk about Paul writing this letter, it helped us to understand a lot more into why this letter was written and how we can learn from this letter, uh, whether it's written by the real Paul or it's written by a second Paul later on. Right. It was written to Timothy, as we already mentioned just now, verse 2 says, it's written to Timothy, uh, my dear son. Now, interestingly, um, Paul not only just said he's my dear son, uh, but uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, sorry, wrong. Huh? This is not in 1 Timothy. I, I make a mistake here. Huh? All this should be 2 Timothy. <laughs> I just realized the mistake I put there. 2 Timothy 1, 2, 2 Timothy 2, 1. And in 2 Timothy 2, 24, Paul, when he was mentioning about the Lord's servant, was implying that Timothy can be the Lord's servant. If that's the case, then you it is a very high honorific title that he's giving to Timothy because nobody can be called the Lord's servant so easily. 
in the Old Testament, the Lord's servant usually be, belong to category of the Lord's prophets. Okay? So when Paul was implying indirectly that Timothy was the Lord's servant, he was giving him high honours. Okay? Who is this Timothy again? From this book itself, 2 Timothy, uh, we know that uh, he was, uh, Paul has laid his hand on him. That means Timothy has been ordained to the ministry. He's somebody that Paul publicly has put his hand over, somebody that Paul has anointed, somebody Paul has said that can be ordained as a leader. So the people know about that. Timothy, as the verses suggest in verse 18 and, and verse 19 of chapter 4, uh, verse 18 of chapter 1, that uh, when Paul refers to people in Ephesus, uh, he, he, he mentioned as though Timothy knows about them. So probably Timothy was still at Ephesus as much as 1 Timothy uh, was written to him when he was in Ephesus. And then, interestingly, of all the people that Paul often mentioned about in his letters, Timothy would be the person that he mentioned the most often. 18 times he refers to Timothy in all these various letters that I've shown you here. Interestingly, even in the book of Hebrews, which author we do not know who, okay, it mentioned about Timothy in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 23. When was this book written? It was written probably in the fall or autumn of AD 67, just before Paul's death by execution. And if we compare it with other books of the Bible, uh, it's probably written about the same time as the book at uh, the Gospel of John, as the book of Hebrews, and maybe also about the same book of Jude, the time of book of Jude. Probably Jude is, was written a bit later, okay, but it was all written a few years from each other. So these are contemporary books, if you can say this. Uh, though all these three books probably, uh, these three books were not written by Paul, unless you think that the book of Hebrew is, is written by him. Okay, this chart I've shown you before, when I show you First Timothy, uh, just to tell you where First Timothy and 2 Timothy sits in relation to other Pauline epistles. Paul's letters can be grouped into three categories. Okay, the missionary letters okay, from Galatians to Romans, the prison epistles, that is from Ephesians, uh, Ephesians to Philippians, and the pastoral epistles, that is 1 Timothy, Titus, and now the last book, 2 Timothy. And if you look up to the top, you'll find that it talks about uh, uh, it's written in Paul's second imprisonment in Rome sometime in 67 to 68 uh, AD. Let me just tell you a little bit about background information, what's going on during this period of time. Okay, what's happening in the world? Okay, Paul lived through five Roman emperors. When he was born in AD 5, he was the Emperor Augustus, uh, who was also the the Caesar when the Jesus was born. But by now the fifth emperor, Nero, has come on the throne. Okay. Nero started well, actually, as a very good emperor for the first five or six years of his reign. However, sometimes after the fifth or sixth year, uh, he became very um, suspicious of uh, enemies. Okay, and uh, he even killed his own mother, murder his own mother, okay, and to consolidate his own power. It was said that in July AD 64, half of Rome was engulfed in fire. Okay? And there was a mounting suspicion that Nero was responsible for this conflagration, for this fire. Okay. And the people suspected that he purposely wanted to remove some slums so that he can build a beautiful palace garden for himself. Now, you find that in many countries, okay, uh, when people are poor and they build their slums, and when, when there's a fire in slums, 
it, it will be a very devastating fire. Right? In the Singapore, uh, we experienced the same thing also, right? I do not know huh, whether when you read the history of Singapore, you realize that uh, when Bukit Ho Sui uh, came under fire at one point of time, in those days, attached houses, it was a attached houses, it was a slum, and uh, it burned down the whole town. And it's because of the being burned down that the government was able to start the first HDB project over there. The Queenstown uh, was built, Bukit Ho Sui was built. So same thing here. This was what happening over here. But here, uh, Nero was a deliberate, people suspected that he deliberately burned down the slums. But in order to push the blame away from himself, okay, Nero actually points the blame of the fire at the Christians as scapegoats. Okay. By then, Christians were already becoming unpopular, not just only uh, with the Jews, but even with the Romans as they preach about their religion, about of one God. So Christians overnight, as a result, were persecuted and they become what I would call in Latin a religio illicito, illicit religion, and they were persecuted. Uh, so you see in this picture here, I show you uh, Nero playing his uh, harp or his fiddle. He was fiddling away, they say, while Rome was being burned. Okay, um, Maybe a way of showing that uh, he has some other way to cover up for himself. Okay, But what was happening to Paul? Okay. Uh, well, I'll just tell you briefly about uh, how uh, Second Timothy come about as a result. Okay, first of all, Paul from his birth to first imprisonment. Paul was born about AD five. Okay, and uh, in uh, AD forty eight to fifty six was his three famous missionary journey that's recorded in the book of Acts. AD fifty six to AD sixty is the first arrest and the imprisonment of Paul. You know, it was such a long period of time because he was first imprisoned in Caesarea and then transported by ship across the Mediterranean Sea to Rome because he insisted that he want to appeal to Caesar. When he was in Rome, probably he did not see Caesar himself, but uh, he was just judged under the courts of Caesar and was put under house arrest for two years in, in the AD 61 to 62. That's found in the book of Acts chapter 28. Okay. In his missionary journeys, he met Timothy first as a small boy, and almost immediately in the next missionary journey, he actually brought Timothy along with him uh, as his assistant. And ever since, Timothy has always been by his side. Now, the story of Second Timothy come about after the release of Paul from his house at rest that is not recorded in our New Testament that is already beyond Acts chapter 28. You can almost call this Acts chapter 29 and beyond. Okay. In AD 62, uh, Paul was released. Okay. Uh, that is found uh, uh, Acts chapter 28 verse 20. Okay. And then in uh, AD 62 to 66, he resumed his uh, missionary travels. Okay. The Paul that we know of, Okay, would not sit still. He continued to travel. Okay, and some people will call this the fourth missionary journey. Probably at this point of time, he visited Spain, as you can see from this diagram over here. There's a possibility that he talked about going to Spain and that he would have visited Spain, okay, fulfilling his dream. Okay, and we look at First Timothy, Titus, and Second Timothy. Uh, the reference to all these places that Paul probably has visited also he, during this AD 62 to 66 after his release from his first imprisonment. Okay, and now uh, we can see all of these here. Now, uh, finally, uh, he was caught and then uh, he was imprisoned in Rome. Okay, and I'm now showing you a picture of Rome. Uh, this is the current day, uh, present day Rome. Uh, and you can see uh, where Paul uh, was in prison uh, in the Rome, even today. Okay. Famously, you see here on red, 
uh, uh, starting from the bottom here is the Colosseum. Okay, there's a famous Colosseum. Next to the Colosseum, you'll see the famous Roman Forum. These two are famous, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, tourist sites today. Okay, and the uh, Roman Forum, you can actually see uh, where uh, Nero has built his beautiful garden palace. Up on top here, in the yellow part, is a place I will, we call it the Marmotin Prison. And today, it is just a very small part uh, of uh, all those archaeological uh, places uh, uh, that uh, you can find in Rome. Okay, And uh, this is the place where Paul was incarcerated, where Peter was also incarcerated before both of them were executed. Okay, Paul being a Roman citizen was executed by beheading and Peter being a Jew was beheaded by crucifixion. Tradition told us that he told the uh, uh, executors you know, he cannot see himself fit to be crucified like the way his Lord was crucified and that he begged to be crucified up, upside down. Well, during the COVID season, uh, uh, me and my wife and my son were able to make a trip uh, to Rome. Okay, and uh, this is the Marmotin prison uh, that we were there. Okay, um, in the first picture, this is as you can see that they have uh, erected a, a church uh, over the dungeon that Paul was in prison. Okay, and uh, but today is no more a church. Uh, today it become a museum. The second picture is the interior. What was once upon a time the sanctuary of this church, okay? And um, right in front of me here, you can see a manhole, okay? This is where uh, prisoners in Rome were let down into the dungeons. All dungeons are like cellar holes, okay? So the only way uh, to go into the prison is to go down the manhole. The only way to be transported out is to pull out of this manhole. So you can see they don't see daylight at all. It's, it's suffering. It's no longer like the uh, home address, uh, home, uh, what do you call it, the uh, uh, house address, uh, uh, address that, that Paul was uh, having. Okay, In the front, okay, it, it, they had two bus, one of Paul and one of Peter, Okay, the two famous uh, apostles who were incarcerated there. Okay. Uh, when you go down, uh, this is the Marmotin dungeon, dungeon uh, where Elaine and I are at right now. Okay, and uh, the, 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 the main hole is basically on top there. Okay, uh, today, of course, we have the luxury. Uh, we go down by leaf or we can go down uh, by staircase. Okay, all right. When Paul was there, not only was he suffering in the prison, he was also suffering for the gospel. He mentioned many times and he was also deserted. And mostly lonely. Many of the people who were with him were no longer with him. Okay, uh, this map shows you. Okay, the green part shows you the people who were not well and who were sick and who were left in different places. Okay, and and the blue arrows shows you the people uh, who were working with him that he deliberately sent out to different places. Okay, like Titus was sent to Dalmatia, for example. Uh, I don't know whether is that a place where there's a lot of spotted dogs or not. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there were some that were also deserted him willfully, like Demas in red over here. He has gone to Thessalonica. Okay. And of course, Timothy and John Mark were also sent to Ephesus, and now his letter was sent to them. Okay. So he has undergone one trial. Chapter 4, verse 16 tells us that uh, he was undergoing the trial uh, and then in his defense, nobody stood up for him. Okay, It was a bad trial for him. And uh, he knew that uh, he, he was uh, not a good uh, uh, prognosis uh, for his release. Okay, And it was at that point of time that he wrote 2 Timothy. Okay? And after that, he was beheaded. If you go to Rome, Okay, and uh, God willing, who knows? Nah? We can make a trip, uh, uh, plan a, a Holy Land trip to, to, to Italy next time. Paul uh, was beheaded in this place, and today they call it uh, St. Paul at the Three Fountains. Okay, tradition says that when Paul was beheaded, his head actually dropped and bounced 
on the ground three times. Okay, and it says that these three times generated three springs of water, a hot one, a warm one, and a cold one. And this St. Paul of the three fountains in this place outside the vicinity of Rome today marks the place of his martyrdom. Okay, so according to ancient historian Eusebius, Paul was beheaded. Okay, and uh, he was beheaded in 67 or 68 AD, just very shortly after 2 Timothy was written, right? The occasion of this letter, why was this letter written? This letter is an exhortation, written to exhort uh, Paul's protege uh, because he knows that his time is running out. And so in this letter, he gave a lot of exhortation. What do I mean by exhortation? Exhortations are verbs, uh, are words, the instruction that do this, do that, be this, be that. Okay, so you see, I've listed all of these here. And I run through the whole Second Timothy, and I found out that they are all together twenty nine exhortations. Okay, starting from the very first one in verse six, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Okay. And then all those that are found in chapter 1 are five of them I put down here in red color and 10 of them are found in chapter 2. Okay? And if you proceed on, uh, one only one exhortation to do something uh, is found in chapter 3. It's continue in what you have learned. And the rest, 13, are all found in the last chapter, chapter 4, including exhortation like the number 13 here. Come and visit me quickly and bring my cloak and bring my scroll and bring my parchment and bring a long mark before winter. Okay, so they are not just only spiritual exhortation. Uh, they are also including errands that Paul uh, wants uh, Timothy to do. And then importantly, I also want to tell you, um, many peoples are mentioned in this letter. Okay, this is one of the letters in which many names are mentioned. Okay, besides the name of Paul and Timothy, I mentioned about three sets of historical figures. The first, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, mentioned 12 times and I've listed to you all the references over here. And David has been talked about one time. And Janice, Jambres and Moses. Okay, this is interesting. Found in chapter 3, verse 8. You cannot find Janice and Jambres any other places in the whole Bible. We really don't know who they are until we consult the uh, Jewish uh, termouts, okay, the Jewish books. And then we realize in the Jewish writing, they did talk about Janus and Jambres. And they mentioned that Janus and Jambres were the two magicians who confronted Moses when he was confronting Moses, uh, Pharaoh with the ten plagues. Remember? When the Moses cast the snake down, now cast the staff down and become snake, and he says that the, the magicians, the Egyptian magicians, could do the same thing, the magicians were Janus and Jambres. Okay, and this is the only place in the Bible where the names of these magicians who opposed Moses and, and Aaron were, 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 were recorded. Okay, uh, chapter three, uh, uh, when you come to it, we'll talk about it. Okay. But more interestingly, I want to take some time to tell you will be the contemporary people at that point of time, okay, uh, who uh, were mentioned. All in, we have 23 names of people mentioned, okay. So therefore, this is really indeed a very personal letter, as I told you, a very pastoral letter. Okay? I'll just elaborate as I see fit, and I'll, I will just skip over some names if I see that I no need to elaborate on them. But I just want you to notice that in this chart over here, I've not only given you the verses that they are found in 2 Timothy, I also tried to give you, as far as I can contain inside the table, okay, other places in the Bible that you talk about these people also. Okay? And I also mentioned to you the places that they were associated. But importantly, the last two columns, you'll see that you know when these people are negatively portrayed, okay, I will also tell you, when they are not negatively portrayed, that means most likely they are positively portrayed, eh? uh, I've also indicated for you. 
The first two figures, of course, you have mentioned. I've mentioned about their names just now when I read the scripture. Lois, the grandmother, and Eunice, the mother of Timothy. Okay, and uh, they were from Lystra. Although Lystra is not mentioned in this letter, we know from Acts chapter sixteen that is the place, uh, birthplace of Timothy. Okay, uh, uh, Lystra. Today, uh, uh, we cannot visit Lystra because uh, uh, there's no archaeological dig, and uh, we we there's no 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 archaeology that uh, determine where exactly uh, is Lystra. Uh, so those of you who are going on the Turkey trip, uh, uh, you we we will we will not be locating Lystra. Okay, uh, because we are not archaeologists. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So then the next two person are negative people, okay? Uh, uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes, okay? They are the one who deserted Paul, okay? And uh, Paul listed them as deserters, okay? And uh, they are people who are said to be from Asia. That means they are not Romans, okay? They are from Asia who follow Paul to the room, Rome, but who subsequently nevertheless deserted Paul, okay? But in comparison to them, there's another person who did not desert Paul. He too came from Asia and from Ephesus, the very city that which uh, Timothy was now residing in. His name was Onesiphorus. Okay? And Onesiphorus, uh, Paul had great high regards for him because Paul mentioned him here. He helped him when he was in Ephesus. That means Paul already knew him there. He was not ashamed of Paul when Paul was in chain. And from this, you can, you, can, you can kind of surmise from here that many Christians were ashamed of Paul. Maybe they don't even, don't even uh, relate to Paul when Paul was in chain. Okay? They were scared that they would be implicated perhaps and were too were put in chain. But only Sephorus was not ashamed. In fact, he searched for, he found Paul in Rome. If you see the kind of Marmitine prison that I told you just now, dungeon, it's not a good place to go to. Uh, the place that I went to was sweep clean like a museum, but in Paul's day, you can imagine, okay, uh, vomit, dunk, blood, and all kinds of things, vermins uh, in the place besides sick people, bad prisoners, and, and everything. Okay, cruel masters and soldiers. Okay, contrast, and he was used as a contrast uh, to Phygelus and and uh, Hermogenes. Uh, wrong spelling here. <clears throat> Next, another two persons uh, who are also negatively mentioned. Uh, sometimes can be very confused with Hermogenes. Is uh, Hermoneus. Okay, uh, Hermoneus departed from the truth. He did not only just depart and desert Paul. He dis departed from the gospel truth. His, and, and not only just that, you know, Hermogenes and Philetus were spreading a false gospel that the resurrection has already taken place. No, what this is not talking about the resurrection of Jesus. This is talking about the future resurrection of believers. And this is that all believers has already been resurrected. Perhaps they were saying that, oh, uh, the, the, the resurrection from the baptism, that is the spiritual resurrection, and that has taken place. There will no longer be any more resurrection after that. And because of that, they threw many people off their faith. Okay? Together with Alexander, they were, uh, Paul uh, in First Timothy uh, was said that he wanted to hand Hermoneus uh, to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. There will be an Alexander that will be mentioned in number 15 later on. Okay, Could that be the same Alexander? We suspect he could be, but he might not be also. Okay, um, Philetus, of course, is the same thing. And both Philetus and, uh, and Hermonius, well, we do not know where they were associated with. But Hermonius, we know that in First Timothy, if he's the same Hermonius that's mentioned there, he will be from Ephesus. Okay. Now, I also mentioned here in chapter 3, verse 11, Paul also mentioned about the places that he suffered persecution and, and, uh, su and, uh, and sufferings. Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and I put down here because just to add up to the number of places that is mentioned in this letter, though uh, no other people were mentioned here in this grey column here, in this grey row. Okay. Demas, I mentioned about him just now, he deserted Paul for Thessalonica. Okay. Um, Crescens, 
okay, has gone to Galatia. Uh, he is uh, positively uh, spoken of. Okay, so probably he's sent there on an assignment, not because of desertion. Okay, Titus, you know, uh, Paul wrote about him. Uh, when Paul wrote about Titus, he was at Crete. Okay, but now uh, he was uh, in Dalmatia. Okay, so you can see how versatile uh, the leaders were in those days. They are not like today, pastors stay in one place, okay, but they go to different churches. Okay, uh, Luke, you know, the one who wrote Acts, okay, um, he, he was with Paul uh, in Rome. Uh, Luke was with Paul, uh, so probably that is in Rome. Uh, he's not mentioned, and that's why I put it in bracket. Uh, Mark, John Mark, uh, his name is mentioned, and uh, Timothy, you are supposed to bring him to see Paul. This was the John Mark that Paul had a negative impression on initially when he first went to the, with Barnabas for the first missionary journey, and then the, he, Mark left them halfway. In the second missionary journey before Paul left, uh, he and Barnabas had a big quarrel over Mark because Barnabas wanted to bring along Mark because Mark was uh, related to Barnabas, uh, but Paul refused to do so because Mark deserted them. But here, okay, he said that Mark was useful for him. So his opinion of Mark changed. Tychicus was mentioned in many parts of the other parts of the letters also. Okay, uh, Paul said that he sent him uh, to Ephesus. And therefore, if Timothy was at Ephesus and Paul was sending Tychicus to Ephesus, many scholars surmise that perhaps Tychicus was the bearer of the letter of 2 Timothy to Timothy. Okay? Carpus was the one who kept Paul's belonging in Troas, okay? the parchment, the scrolls, and importantly, the cloak. All this suggests that when Paul left those things there, he must have left them in a hurry. Paul cannot be so forgetful to leave his things there. Probably, uh, it suggested that perhaps Paul was apprehended the second time okay, at Troas. Okay? And uh, that's why he left his thing there okay, hastily and could not bring them along with him. Alexander, the one I mentioned to you just now with Hermes, he was said to be a metal worker who did Paul great harm. Okay, and who strongly opposed Paul's message. There was another Alexander mentioned in Acts 19. Could he be the same Alexander? There is a probability, and he could also probably be the same Alexander uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Okay. <clears throat> Priscilla and Aquila, we know about them uh, in Acts, and in uh, Paul mentioned about them, husband and wife team. At this point of time, okay, uh, they probably may be in Ephesus also because Paul talked about you know greeting them as well. Okay, only Sephora's household was also mentioned, not only just only Sephora's. Okay, in uh, chapter four, verse nineteen, his entire household was mentioned. Okay, so uh, his household will probably be in Ephesus, and only Sephora's will probably be in Rome because he was visiting Paul. Uh, Aristus, okay, uh, he stayed in Corinth, okay. Uh, Ar Aristus uh, is somebody uh, that you can find some uh, things about him also. And uh, Trophimus uh, was uh, uh, sick and left in Miletus. And then, uh, then there were a few people here, uh, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, and Claudia. Uh, interestingly, I just want to point out to you, number 22, Linus. Okay, uh, Not to point out to you because you can find, find him in Charlie Brown, uh, but because uh, you can find Linus uh, as the second bishop of Rome after Peter, according to Roman Catholic tradition. Okay, And they believe that it was this same Linus that is mentioned in 2 Timothy who became the second uh, bishop of Rome or the Pope of Rome, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. His wife is Claudia, but some suggest that here the Claudia here could be his mother because Pudens and Claudia are probably husband and wife. Okay. So all in 23 persons mentioned, 13 places mentioned. Out of these 23 people mentioned, uh, 17 of them are just found from verse 9 to verse 21 of chapter 4 alone. Okay, And 17 of them are positively mentioned and 6 of them are negatively mentioned. All right, I've come uh, 
uh, what do you call that, uh, uh, to this point of time, that uh, I'd like to take a 10 minute break, okay, so that uh, you can rest. And then, uh, but before I take the 10 minute break, maybe I just ask anybody has any question uh, or any comments? Would you like to just uh, begin to uh, mention them right now? Anybody? Before we go for our break? Questions, comments? Okay, if not, uh, it's time to take a rest and uh, look at this uh, black clock up on the corner here. Okay, and uh, you can just take a break and then uh, when the time is up, uh, uh, we, we will start again. Oh, we start. Does anybody has any question? Feel free to ask. Okay. Uh, if not, the next part, basically what we're going to do is that uh, we are going to go into right now the book itself. We have talked about the background information. Right now we want to talk about the book itself. All right, uh, it's been a joy this past uh, uh, months and uh, weeks uh, to kind of prepare uh, this uh, Second Timothy and uh, uh, to able to derive uh, this uh, overview in this table form. Uh, very satisfying uh, when you find yourself able to uh, come out to derive something like that and uh, enjoying uh, the, uh, this book itself. Okay, so the structure and the overview or, or Second Timothy, okay, right now. Now, let me just say this first. Second Timothy falls into a category of book that we call personal paraenetic letter. What are paraenetic letters? Huh? Paraenetic para letters are just that what I tell you just now. They are letters, personal letters, given to give personal instructions or exhortation to somebody to do something. Okay, do this, do that, do this, do that. And exactly that's what uh, Second Timothy is all about. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he was telling Timothy, Timothy, I want you to do this. Timothy, you know, fan, you know, fan your gift. Timothy, I want you to continue. You know, I want you to be steadfast. I want you to endure. Okay, I want you to suffer, you know, and, and, and things like that. So this is a para and anetic letter. Now, <clears throat> The main theme of 2 Timothy, if we can put it this way, will be faithful to the end. Faithful to the end. Uh, this is a powerful uh, uh, thing. Uh, faithfulness, we all know. And to the end here is really go all the way. Faithfulness all the way. A very powerful, therefore inspiring uh, uh, work that, that we, we, we can draw a lot of inspiration from. Each chapter... Now, from chapter 1 to 4, I, I find that uh, I just borrow some of this here, uh, basically from Chuck Swindoll, uh, modifying uh, some of his things over here. Yeah, there will be a sub theme. Chapter 1, we can call it faithful to the cause. Chapter 2, faithful in Christ. Chapter 3, faithful under challenges. Chapter 4, faithful until completion. Chuck Swindoll talk about perspective, okay, and many people understand that chapter one and two are talking about a kind of a present perspective, and chapter three and four are talk about some kind of future perspective. Uh, but I, I make it more definite here. I, I put down chapter one talk about the past perspective because Paul was reminding Timothy also about his past. Chapter two is is a very critical one because it's talk about the present, okay, and it talk about Christ. You and Christ in the present and how you can be faithful to him. Chapter 3 talk about bad people. Talk about you know um, uh, uh, terrible times that is to come. Talk about the future. And you talk about uh, how Timothy is supposed to handle these challenges from these people in the future. It's the future. Chapter 4, of course, number 1 is the end of the book. Okay. Talk about some end matters. Paul talk about you know, the end of my life coming soon. 
Okay, talk about end of this letter. No, I want you to bring certain things to me. But more importantly, it talk about not just the end as the end. We talk about the end of things, the end of times. Okay, when Christ will be the judge. Okay, and how you can be faithful to the completion. So into all these, I can find that there are different tones as Paul go from each chapter to the other. He started from the past. He's talk about reminders, talking about present, talk about exhortation, talking about the future, talk about warnings, and the last part, talk about requests. Okay? The idea of faithfulness to the end is really a theme in this book, as you can see here. Faithfulness is the key. It's key to the mindset is communicated. Paul, as I mentioned to you, is talking to Timothy about a mindset that he needs to have. And he's trying to tell Timothy, Timothy, as I leave this world, there is one thing I want you to keep on doing is be faithful. Be faithful. Okay, though this word is not prominently repeated, the idea of faithfulness is prominent. It's prominent in such other words like Paul used. Like he says the word keep keeping, or the word not to be ashamed, or the word shame, or the word suffer or suffering, okay, or the word guard, or the word continue. All these give you the idea of the word faithfulness, even though the word faithfulness is not really used in those places. But the word faith you know, is actually used 10 times in this book itself. So we can simply say that faithfulness is uh, the key mindset that Paul wants to communicate. This uh, letter, as I mentioned, can be divided into four main parts. Okay? They are parts, uh, four main parts of encouragement, of instruction to remain faithful to or faithful in, firstly, the past, okay, and which you talk about in the course, and then the present to Christ, and the future because of challenges, and the end unto completion. If you put it this way, this will be uh, talk about the whole book already. But I think that's not enough, right? We want to go deeper. We want to go into more details, right? Now, if you ask me what is the key chapter, the key chapter among all the four will be chapter two. Because that is where the exhortation is given, okay? Uh, if you want to talk about want to be a leader, want to be a minister, want to be a pastor, want to be a Christian, what must you do? Chapter two. Is the one that is full of specific instruction in what you can apply in your life. If you talk about a key verse or passage, I will say 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Okay? Let me just read it out to you. Paul says this to Timothy, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learn it. You see, this is already talking about his past, talking about the Lois, talking about the Eunice, talking about the Paul that he has learned from. And to talk about continuing, okay, continuing uh, to learn in all of these things. Paul talked about the example of Onesiphorus, talk about the example of Paul himself, okay, and he says that you can continue. And then verse 15, how from infancy as a young boy, as a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. It talks about the importance of the Scriptures in helping you to be grounded in faithfulness. Be faithful in being grounded in the Holy Scriptures because they are able to make you wise. Wise for salvation, and that's basic, through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about you know, perhaps the greatest verse in the New Testament that talk about the authority of the scripture that all of us know, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is God brief and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the servant of God, you see, the servant of God, again, imply here again the name for Timothy. He is a servant of God. Okay, big title. May be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Teaching, teaching what is right. Rebuking, rebuking what is not right. Correcting, correcting when you are doing what is not right. 
training, training to help you do what is right. It's all about doing the right thing. OK, and then if we talk about in detail. Uh, we can see that the book of Timothy can be further divided into this way. Chapter one, OK, uh, verse one to two is the greetings. Verse one, verse three to seven is the reminders. OK, reminding and remember okay, who you are. OK, verse eight to 14. Uh, talks about uh, not being ashamed, okay? And uh, verse 15 to 18 talk about examples, good examples and bad examples. And so this will be the reminders through the examples, reminders not to be ashamed, reminders of the past spiritual heritage that you have, reminders, okay? Second part here, number two, the chapter two, we can divide it into five parts, exhortations of faithfulness in Christ. Faithfulness in Christ, so it says be strong in Christ. Remember Christ, okay? A proof worker, okay, not ashamed, if I can put it, is of Christ, okay? And the uh, instruments, okay, in found in the household, instruments of Christ, okay? Servant of the Lord. Just now I mentioned about that, the servants of Christ. Okay? So it's all about Christ and uh, exhorting us to be, to, to, to be like workers of Christ. Chapter 3, talk about faithful under challenges, the future warnings. Okay? So we talk about challenges from the world in chapter 3, verse 1 to 9. Second part, verse 10 to 13, talk about conduct exemplified by God's worker, Paul himself. Paul says, I am the example okay, to counter these challenges. And then last part, chapter, four, chapter 3, verse 14 to 17, talk about continuing in the word. And that's where we got the part on all scripture is God brief. Okay? And we have to go to chapter 4, we can divide it into also five parts. The first part, verse 1 to verse 5, talk about a charge for the end, a charge for the end times. Okay? And then verse 6 to 8, talk about Paul ready for his own end. He says, I'm now ready to be given up as a drink offering. Okay? And then verse 9 to 13, talk about Paul's personal request for his end, personal request for Timothy. Verse 14 to 18, talk about Paul's oppositions to he, at his end. How at his last defense, nobody stood up for him. And then last part, of course, is greetings at the end. Okay. So this will help you see that this is a flow of first or uh, second Timothy. The color here are not just to make it colorful. Huh? <laughs> the color here are color coded to tell you that this will be how our sermons will be uh, apportioned and divided. Okay. Except that I make a mistake here. Uh, uh, chapter two, there's a white part there that should be in blue color also. Okay, that should be blue color also. Okay, so you look at the color code. They are all together. If you put the white part into blue color, there are all together eight colors here. Okay, that means there are eight sermons that will be preached in Bartley Church in this manner. Okay, although they will not be following this as titles. Uh, these are just uh, ex exegetical ideas. Uh, these are not the titles of the sermons. Okay. Now, if I can name one verse and take out from each chapter and say what will be the one verse that talk about the, the key verse of each chapter, this will be them. Okay. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.14 will be the key verse for chapter 1. And it says, God, the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Wow, this is one of the key words here. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Okay, these are key words in this book. Chapter 2 will be 2 Timothy 2.1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in the Christ Jesus. When I talk about this chapter as being faithful in Christ, okay, this chapter, this first verse, okay, tell us how we can be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And chapter three will be back to the same verse about, that we talked about just now. As for you, continue 
in what you have learned and become convinced. Continue. If you remember just now, I talked to you about 29 exhortations of this book. Chapter 3, there's only one exhortation and is found in this verse 14. Continue in what you have learned. Today, I say to you the same thing. Continue in what you are learning. Don't give up. Okay. Continue in the spiritual heritage that you receive from your past leaders, Bible study leader, your mentor, the pastors who have taught you, the lecturers that have taught you God's word. Continue in what your parents, your Christian parents, has imparted unto you. Continue. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. Okay? And the last chapter, the key verse will be chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be prepared in season, out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. When you put all of these together, you see the faith that's entrusted to you is for you to guard, is for you to find strength in Christ, is for you to continue them in, and it's for you to propagate and proclaim and preach. Okay? So the theme here is uh, faithful uh, to the end. Okay? And uh, it will also be the same theme for our pulpit series from 4th of August to 22nd of uh, September. Two solid months after this Bartley Missions Month, uh, we will be going into Timothy already. Okay? So in two weeks' time, uh, this is what uh, we'll be talking about. Uh, this is the sermon series. Um, uh, Pastor Jason will be doing the first one, uh, August the 4th. Uh, we do not have the title yet. Uh, the title will come out we'll probably when they are ready, we'll let you know. But we only have the content here. This will help the speakers give a, a, a idea of where they are going. Okay, so just now I told you, uh, uh, these are the eight uh, sermons. Uh, uh, and then after Daniel, Gloria, Pastor John G, Elder Lawrence, uh, myself, I'll be doing chapter three. Then SP Joe and then Albert Tivikram will close everything on 22nd of September. Okay. All right. Now, indentation or indenting the scriptures. Okay. Uh, how did I, maybe you'll be wondering, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to share with you a very simple method of uh, understanding an outline of the Bible. Okay. And uh, this is a method we call indentation. Okay. And I've just shown you purposely. This is the raw research work that I did. Okay. Using the NIV Bible. I just cut and paste the NIV Bible. Uh, 2 Timothy onto my Word document, okay? And then the, basically as I read it, I try to understand it by indentation, okay? If this belongs to an elaborate point of this, I indent it in. And if that continue to elaborate on it, I continue to indent it further. For example, you look with me, now chapter 1, verse 1. It starts with Paul, so I start with Paul. An apostle of Christ Jesus. Oh, it described Paul. So I intended one part down. Okay. By the will of God. Oh, apostle by the will of God. Okay, I intend it further. Okay, because it explained it further. And then it says, in keeping with the promised life of life that is in Christ Jesus. I intend it further because it elaborated further. Okay? By way of this indentation, you'll be able to find what is the key point and uh, what are the sub points building up to it. And it helps you, therefore, to be able to see the overall theme in different parts of a book in the Bible. Of course, this way of exercise um, is uh, not the accurate for a few reasons. Number one, it depends. It's subjective to the person reading it. What you are seeing is my indentation, my understanding. Somebody else may indent them differently from me. It is okay. It doesn't mean that I'm right, you are wrong, or you are right, I'm wrong. Okay. Some of us, there may be most of us should be have some somewhat similar, but there may be some minor part that are different. That's one thing. Number two, indentation also could be affected by the Bible version that you are using. Because you need to understand the English Bible versions are already a kind of translation already. 
already a kind of interpretation already. So the NIV and the ESV was maybe different because they interpret it a little bit differently, or the KJV for that matter. For this, I'm using the NIV because most of the time in church, we use the NIV in Bartley Christian Church. Okay? And also for me personally, I use, I'm very used to the NIV. But really, the NIV may not be the best for doing this kind of identity work because the NIV is what we call the equi dynamic equi 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 equivalent kind of version. It tries to interpret according to, it tries to translate according to the flow of the language rather than to the accuracy of the words. Okay? So another version may do better than this. You know? But nevertheless, uh, what I'm trying to say is that different translations will affect your indenting. Okay? So here, when it comes to the next person, Paul, uh, Timothy, you find that I put it back, okay, like typewriter, go back to the front again. Let's talk about a new subject already, Timothy. And then my dear son explain and describe Timothy. Okay? Now, all these gray part that I highlighted, they are, I put them there later on at the, after, after I, I put in the verses. Okay, uh, they are my subtitling. Okay, after I so from the first part, I can deduce that it's greetings because I talk about Paul and then to Timothy. So that's why I could put it down as greetings. And then from verse three, you see, talk about three important things: grace, mercy, and peace. This is very interesting. If you notice that if you compare this with other parts of the Bible, you find that in other letters written by Paul. Usually the greetings is just grace and peace. Grace and peace. You know, you know why grace and peace is the greetings? Because peace, shalom, will be the Jewish form of greeting. Okay. Grace will be the Greek form of greetings like the people. So Paul was trying to put in both grace and peace, grace and peace. But interestingly, in the two letters to Timothy, Paul add in the word mercy, mercy to Timothy. It seems like Paul have a special understanding of, of, of Timothy. That he's, he's telling Timothy, no, they just grace and peace. But really, I'm wishing upon you God's mercy. Okay. He talk about his, his great specialness of a feeling for Timothy and his understanding of Timothy. Okay. So these are three different things. So I put them there, therefore, three, the same thing here, yeah. Greeks, mercy, peace, okay? And then from God, okay, the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. you find out here from God, and then the Father, we know the Father is God, but when he put down here Christ Jesus, our Lord, he's putting Jesus Christ in the same status as the Father. He's talking about the divinity of Jesus Christ here, okay? God. He is God also. Okay? And then Paul says, I send you grace, mercy, and peace. Okay? And I then say, I thank God. Some people may put, I thank God, you know, right to the left again. Uh, That's fine. Okay, I happen to put it here. Uh, yeah. So here, I just want to tell you, so this is one good way of understanding uh, of a passage, uh, how you have to understand the overview of a book, you can do it. Especially, uh, you find that this is not too laborious because it's a short book, First Timothy, Second Timothy. Uh, but you you probably can't do this kind of thing for books like Psalms. Uh, firstly, because Psalm is not one one letter by itself. Psalm is many different Psalms, so Im impossible to do for the whole Psalms. But you can do it for one Psalm, okay? Or you can do it uh, for but and you can probably cannot do it for Proverbs. But Proverbs are different one proverb by itself. Okay, so they don't have a flow. But for letters, especially, it is very good for you to use this method. If you are talking about a narrative like the gospel, probably you may want to, want to take out only the narrative, one part of the one story, and do an indentation to find out, to, to learn about the flow of the narrative. But it probably is too hard to do for the whole gospel, though it is still necessary to do if you want to study the whole gospel. There's another thing that I'm doing here that I, I, I want to point out to you here is that I, I've highlighted certain words here by putting them in bold. For example, the name of Paul, the name of Timothy, the name Christ Jesus. 
These are repeated terms or key terms that I want to know. Remember, recalling, reminded. Yeah, wow, I, I find that there are a lot of these re-words. And that's why it helped me to understand. Therefore, that the first chapter will be a reminder from the past. And see, that's how I arrived at my first part. Okay. So you can see, I won't elaborate further, but you can see as I go down, okay, the whole Timothy is here. Now, this is a second page, okay. Um, you'll find that those words that's on the left side, they become the main theme, okay. And the word from the right side become the sub theme. Okay, so you begin to see that I'm beginning to see keywords shooting out at me, okay, on the left side and when they are in bold, okay, and I'm beginning to able to form, okay, my sub theme according to here and then my main theme of this book, faithfulness, for example, chapter two, faithfulness in Christ. Okay, so I'm just leaving this to you. This is my raw work for you to teach you that this is one way you can learn the Bible. Okay, uh, for example, this is the passage that I'll be preaching. Okay, so I, I'm doing these studies for myself in preparation for my own sermon to come. Okay, so when I talk about chapter three, I say, oh, challenges from the world. Uh, right, so uh, verse one, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last day People will be, and oh, I realize that wow, there are 18 characteristics that they have talk about him, about these people. The 19th one, uh, the one that is over here in verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying his power, is possible to be a 19th one. But here the NIV helps me. They put an M dash over here. Uh, that means it's trying to tell me that it described the 18 one. It is an elaboration of the 18 one. That when they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, it's because they are having a form of godliness but denying his power. So it's not the 19 one. Okay. So just to tell you some of these things, huh? Okay, okay. I'll just skip this right now. Okay, you can go back and do a Bible study lah, huh, using this if you want to. <laughs> but I want to uh just uh, Talk about the last thing about Second Timothy tonight here. Uh, before I go into the resources, will be ten big lessons. Okay, again, I derived this from the earlier eleven pages that I show you. Okay, uh, how I when I indent, it helped me see uh, what are the key lessons in Timothy. And as I list them one by one, I realize that eh, I got ten lessons. What are the 10 lessons? And this is something that I hope you can be inspired of as you go back, to, uh, as you finish tonight. Okay. First, it is about the remember or a reminder. The book of 2 Timothy is big on reminding your spiritual heritage and your calling. Earlier on, I already mentioned to you, whoever you are, whether you are first generation Christian or you are a second generation Christian. You have a spiritual heritage. You have a spiritual past that you have inherited from God. Can you remember it? And that's the reason why we ask you now our uh, baptism and our membership class people to write their personal testimony. It's a way of remembering the spiritual heritage. Remembering is so powerful for all of us. Spiritual heritage is so important. What are your parents? What If you are a second generation Christian, what have your parents done uh, to impart that spiritual heritage for you? However little that could be. You know, <clears throat> four people, four men were boasting to one another about the Bible versions that they liked and they, their favorite Bible version. The first person says, I like the KJV, the King James Version, because it is classic and the English is so powerful, you know, and I derive so much joy just in memorizing using the King James Version. The second person says, no, well, I, 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 I prefer the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. Because that's the version in which it, word for word, they go for the Greek and the, in the Hebrew word and they translate the word as accurately as possible. It's the best for Bible study. Okay, And the third person say, well, my version is not the NASB or not the KJV, it's the NIV. Because like I said, no, it, it's flowing in contemporary English, it flow with today's English. Okay? Well, the last person says, my version is the MPT. 
everybody look at him. Like, what MPT is a new version? We never heard about MPT before. What do you mean? What, what is MPT? This person is just sheepish. They say, you never heard about MPT? It, it, it is my parents' translations. <laughs> my parents' translation. It is the translation of the Bible as lived out by my parents as I observed them. This is my Bible, my favorite version. Friends, would you become your MPT for the next generation? Because they need something to be reminded of, something to remember. There are many other powerful lessons that I learned here. The lessons of be not ashamed. Be not ashamed, therefore, of the testimony. You need to understand in the context of 2 Timothy, Paul was incarcerated because of his testimony for Christ. Paul was not ashamed. Many, because they were afraid that they, can, they would drop into the same predicament of Paul, were caught being ashamed. Today, I want to ask you, would you be not ashamed of the testimony of Christ? Would you say that I will study God's word? Would you say that I will testify for Christ? Would you say that I will make a stand for Christ always? Would you be the kind of servant who says, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. And therefore, if that's so, would you therefore suffer and endure hardship for the sake of the gospel? That is the other lesson. That's found here. The other important action word that's found here, suffer. The word is suffer, by the way. Suffer. I'm not talking, I'm not using the King James Version and then you think that suffer means uh, old English. This is from the NIV Bible. I lifted all these words that I mentioned from the NIV Bible. Suffer. The contemporary NIV Version says suffer. It tells us that we had to be prepared for suffering. I think today we preach a lot about the joys of heaven, the joys of Christian life, the assurance of salvation. But we forgot you know, that suffering and sacrifices are also part and parcel of the gospel that we need to preach about. And therefore, it is a gospel that we also not only just not ashamed, but suffer, but also to guard. God. And the word here is entrusted. God, what is entrusted to you? Somebody says Christianity is only one generation from extinction. If this generation, our generation, fail to God, the next generation will find Christianity something that is extinct. We have to be faithful to God what is entrusted. Next, we talk about be strong. It's an encouragement here. Be strong. Be strong in what? Be strong in Christ's grace. It's not the gospel of Christ is not just about suffering, not just about sacrifice, not just about negative feeling kind of things, but it's also talking about the grace of God, the grace of Christ that you can be strong in. Okay? Next word is the word entrust. Entrust come to the forefront right now. Entrust what you have been heard. Second Timothy 2 2 is a favorite verse for many of us. Huh? The things you have heard of me and trust of faithful men who will teach others also. Okay. Okay, this <clears throat> is, is entrusting to generations or spiritual generations after us. I like the seventh point here. Be a workman. A workman approved and not ashamed. Okay. Um, this, the acronym is A-W-A-N-A, -A -A, AWANA. Okay, uh, my children, when they were overseas, uh, they used to belong to a group called the AWANA. Awana Club, which is like a Christian kind of Boy Scout group in the church where they emphasize on the Word of God, memory, memorizing the Word of God. A workman, a proof, not a shame. And the next part of this verse is rightly dividing the truth. Dividing the truth, that means cutting a straight line. Can you cut a straight line? Do you know the Bible well? And that's why today for 2 Timothy, I deliberately teach you about indentation, about cutting the Bible in a straight line. Okay, Let's learn to master the Bible, that the Bible may master us. Okay? Number eight, continue in the scripture. This is the only verb here that is ongoing. 
Uh, it's talking about ongoing, continue, the, the sense of ongoing. Continue, going, keep going on, keep going on. It's not just a flash in the pan kind of thing. Okay, The scripture has been given to you. Continue, be faithful in it. Continue in the scripture. Okay, But not only just continue in it for your own sake. Not only just learn the Bible for your sake. The Bible is meant to be learned to lead, believe and to be preach. So the next one says, preach the word. And then finally, you will be like Paul. You'll be like Timothy. you realize that this whole thing is a battle. And I want to encourage you, my brothers, my sisters, fight the good fight. The second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 8, can rightly be inscribed on each and every one of our tombstone one day when we say that I have finished the race, I, mean, I fought the good fight. Okay. And uh, these are 10 big lessons uh, that I'd like to share with you. And a uh, lesson for you to go back to think about uh, how God has spoken to you today through 2 Timothy. Okay, I want to end by sharing with you a few resources. Thankful for some of these resources, some of which I've uh, really used uh, for this uh, preparation. Some of these are everlasting that you know, everlasting in the sense that I've always been telling you about them. Uh, first of these everlasting one is Thomas Constable. Uh, uh, he is uh, always updating his uh, commentary and he's always free given in the internet. Okay, and I've given you the link here. Uh, it's always updated because you always open to it. You find it is always in the latest year, huh? like now a 2024 version. So I like it that you know, it's updated all the time. Okay, Thomas Constable. Okay, uh, but uh, of course, you need to understand that many of these commentators have their own slant of view. Okay, but it's okay. As long as you know where they are coming from, okay, when you come to something that you may disagree with him, it's okay. Okay, but they'll find that there'll still be many gems that you can pick up from them. Thomas Constable is from Dallas Theological Seminary, so he has slanted towards that direction. Huh? Yeah. So this is just a pickup of the pitch from Sonic Light that you can take uh, from the internet. Okay, the second person I want to um, uh, mention to you is uh, the same person that I mentioned to you the last time when I talked about Genesis, and that is Mike Mazalongo. Mike Mazalongo has become one of my favorite uh, person to watch on YouTube because he cover every book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation uh, uh, for lay people, but in elaborate way. For example, just the book of uh, Genesis alone, uh, uh, he has 50 videos, five zero videos, okay, for the book of Genesis, how elaborate he cover, okay, so he's therefore one of my favorites, but I want to tell you when you watch Mike uh, Mazalongo, you need to be careful because the, this video teaching series is, uh, is very clear, uh, firstly, and a good point, uh, it's very clear, and it's very generous because he provides you all his PowerPoints. He provides you all his written notes. And I want to tell you some of his written notes, I've captured it and I've shared with you also. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's found, for example, in this uh, PDF version, first, second Timothy titles for beginners. I've extracted something from him here. Okay. And he even had his own PowerPoints that you can find there, and PowerPoints that he used uh, in his videos. Okay. However, do note a caveat here. Some views presented are not in line with our church. Okay, example on spiritual gifts. Okay, for example, Mike will talk very strongly about the cessation of some spiritual gifts. Okay, uh, which is not what Bartley uh, talked about. Or he's very strong against women in leadership, which is also not what Bartley talked about. He's from the Church of Christ, and so that, that is their denomination, and he's very strong on his denomination view. Okay. But but then he doesn't talk about all these kind of things all the time. Okay. And he doesn't make the Bible talk about all these things. Okay. He only in certain part he interpret it in that way. But other than that, I, I benefited a lot from him. So so what I'm trying to say is that look at the resources, but then okay, always uh, be, uh, uh, have some caveats. Okay. Okay, so this is his uh, website that you can, in the Bible talk is called, again, okay, you can find, okay, he, he, a lot of things generously made available for you. 
other articles, student workbooks, teachers' guides, and things like that, uh, podcasts and everything. This is the one on uh, Second Timothy. Okay, and uh, even even they have a course for you. You you can take it as a course, and, and they have tests for you, and you can freely download all of these for free. Okay. The third resource is uh, Robert Solomon, uh, the Methodist, former Bishop of uh, Methodist Church in Singapore. Uh, under the our daily bread has commissioned him to write uh, many of these books uh, on journey through. Uh, Journey through First Second Timothy is a devotion book uh, of about fifty chapters. That means you can do it if you are doing it on uh, fifty days. You can get it over in fifty days. Okay, you can get this book uh, from uh, our Daily Bread uh, 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 office. Okay, or you can also get a free version, online version here. Okay, and uh, basically the staff actually have been using this for our staff devotion also. We just completed this book uh, several weeks ago. Okay, so the online version is this one. You can go to online and you can get it free. Okay, I've given you the link also. Okay, and the second Timothy is found here. But third source uh, as a new source that I'm introducing is Study Light. Okay, studylight.org uh, uh, basically uh, give you a lot of verse by verse commentaries. And very powerful. Uh, interestingly, uh, just now I talked about the first one, Thomas Constable, is one of the commentary that you can find here. So you don't even need to go Constable, you can come here and find. And there are many other classic ancient commentaries uh, that are here. Uh, sorry, not ancient, uh, but, but a, a few hundred years kind of ago kind of commentaries that are today uh, free uh, for everybody to use. But they also have some good modern day commentaries like William Buckley's commentary found inside here. Okay, so this is a very good source. Okay, and not just commentary, you can find other things, other Bible study tools here. It's like the blue letter Bible kind of thing here. Um, okay, and then this is also another new source that I'm sharing with you, Chuck Swindoll. Um, I, I told you that I actually uh, was inspired by him in my, my table. Okay, I, I, I forgot to uh, blow out his table, but you will see here in this small little part here, uh, is it, is a table of Second Timothy that I actually borrowed some of his concepts here. You, you can see, obviously, I, I borrowed from him some of the things there. Okay, so Chuck Swindoll, uh, former uh, president of Dallas Theological Seminary also. Yeah. And then finally, uh, we, Warren Wisby, one of my favorite scholars, uh, uh, passed away just a few years ago and uh, greatly made his uh, uh, simple commentary of the Old Testament and New Testament free on the Bible uh, uh, in, in the internet for you. Okay, so these are just overview of the books. Uh, they, so they are not very elaborate, uh, but you, you can still pick up a lot of things from Warren Wisby. Okay? So these are the resources that I'm sharing with you. Yeah, I just want to end here, uh, my sharing here. I just stop here. If you have any questions or any comments or anybody, I'll be glad to answer them right now. Anybody? Comments or questions? Would it be okay if I ask one of you to help me close in prayer if that's uh, the case, if I don't hear anything and we are also times up? Oh. Maybe can I get just uh, our brother Kim Singh to pray for us? Uh, Kim Singh, are you still here? See your name here. Yes, I'm here. Uh, uh, I took you... a while to unmute myself. Oh, yes. <laughs> I presume that's the case. Yeah, yeah. Come, would you mind uh, close us in yes. prayer? Sure, sure. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, wanting the Holy Spirit to guide our minds and also uh, to enable Pastor Ma to uh, illuminate our uh, understanding of uh, 
Second Timothy, the book that you have uh, uh, enabled uh, uh, the Apostle Paul to write, and that now we are able to benefit in learning uh, your word. We pray, Father God, that as we embark uh, in uh, various uh, cell group uh, to study your word and also over the pulpit, Lord, that uh, we will be encouraged uh, by journeying uh, together with the Holy Spirit uh, into understanding uh, the richness and the wisdom of Christ. So depart, uh, or rather dismiss us uh, right now and uh, grant us a good night rest and also enable us to have uh, uh, renewed strength to uh, for the new day tomorrow. We thank you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I have two important announcements to end uh, before you, you leave this. Okay, firstly, number one, uh, this session is recorded. And once it's ready, we will let you know. And uh, you're free to share the recordings with anybody to, to, to listen and to watch. Okay, that's number one. And number two is that uh, the WhatsApp group that you are signed up in, uh, we have changed the group. As you said, it's called the Sermon Series group right now. Uh, and the whole idea is that uh, we'll keep this group and uh, you have questions or you've got any good resources regarding 2 Timothy, but let's keep it to 2 Timothy only. Okay, don't talk about your sales of your own items or whatever. <laughs> don't bring personal matters here. But talk about anything regarding 2 Timothy, you can bring it up in this chat group. We will close this chat group when a new sermon series chat group is started. When will we start a new sermon series chat group? We will start a new sermon series chat group in 2025 when we have planned and put in place a similar kind of uh, sermon series uh, zoom classes like this at this point of time uh, i want to tell you uh, we have not yet planned next year's sermons so we do not know okay which books we are using but usually by october we will have confirmed uh, what the sermon series for the next year, somewhat. And once we confirm, for example, we know that we are going to study, let's say, three books next year. Maybe, let's say, example only. Eh? We are going to study Romans. We are going to study uh, Deuteronomy. We are going to study Proverbs. Let's say. Okay? And then, we, we, because we are going to have that in our sermon, we will have three of this kind of Zoom classes. Okay? And we will ask for people to register for these three classes. But at the same time, once you register for the first class, we will keep you in that chat group, okay? So that you, you, we, we will, we will invite you to come for the second class. So we'll send you the link to come for the second class. So we will change, you know, from let's say from Proverbs to Deuteronomy, okay, uh, along the way down the year as we as, as the book change, okay. So this is what we are going to do next year. All right. So we will close this group, okay, uh, at end of this year or once we begin to plan for the next year's uh, book studies. Okay? All right? Okay, God bless and uh, good night to all of you. Thank you, Pastor.